Okay, we got some uh, some more differential stuff. I'm trying to uh, sand this in a little bit so you can basically get a good solid understanding of this. There, there are some uh, pictures on here that you're probably going to see on your driveline final exam. One of your driveline. And so we start here. We got an exploded view. You're ready to identify all these parts. Uh, this would be the differential with has the little spider gears in it. There's your pinion. There's your ring gear. These little cone bearings here. And that's really interesting to me, the way they got that drawn there. Because that vaguely looks sort of like the shape of an old Model T. As far as that goes, but it's kind of funny. But anyway, basically you got them all in bearings. And you got a little bearing preload space. Where it's called a, it's a crush sleeve, actually. You've got a bearing cup there. And you don't really usually have a gasket. Most of the time we use silicone on those, although there are gaskets available for them. Um, a bearing adjusting nut on some of them, basically you can set your backlash by screwing that one over a little bit and screwing that one in a little bit. And you also set your bearing through over that. And then out here, uh, you've got uh, that particular one uh, is not really drawn right. That axle like that does not go in this kind of a rear end. So it's just sort of a crummy drawing. Uh, your pumpkin type, basically the cover was welded on the back of it and the pumpkin goes in the front. So you set all of this up on the bench, all your gears and everything, and then you put it in there and there is a flange on here. Notice there's a hole in that uh, hub and you turn that hub to every place where there's a, a socket, I mean where there's a retainer, a bolt, and you take all those out and then you just pull the axle out. It doesn't have any C-clips in there because you can't get to them. That's the only way that is, you know. Uh, but anyway, that's got no removable, removable rear cover, and it seals around the front. That whole pumpkin goes in the front. All right. Now, for the story about my 74 F100. So this has got to do with the, with the differential. Uh, this, was, uh, this was my house. I bought that house at, uh, in 1980 for $16,000 <laughs> on Lakeshore Drive in Port Arthur, Texas. But anyway, and the house is still there, by the way, but it looks different now. I bought that truck for 2000 bucks. Uh, in 1978, it had a 302, 3 on the tree, 332 gears in the chunk. All right, 332 gears means what? 3.32 turns of the drive shaft for each turn of the wheels. That's what 3.32 means. You know, your racing car people are talking about 411 gears and all this kind of stuff. That's more turns of the drive shaft to the turn of the wheels, and it gives you more torque and all that. All right, and so that's what that chunk looked like in the truck. And here you got a tag on there. And I was looking at that little tag, I saw I had 332 gears on it. Gas was 45 cents a gallon then, it cost $6 to fill it up from dead empty to full. That was 20 gallons you could get for six bucks. All right, so first time I filled it up, I thought I was doing a quote, because how am I going to afford to pay $6 every time I fill it? You know, because the little car I was driving before cost $3 to put 10 gallons in it. It took seven miles to the gallon. Horrible, but it was manageable at 45 cents a gallon. You know, I wasn't too terribly bad. All right, so President Carter deregulated the price of gas and predicted to go to a dollar a gallon before the end of the year. It did, and I had to do something about the fuel economy. All right, so what I did was I put a little fine mesh screen under the carburetor to atomize the fuel better, because somebody told me about that. And it made the engine run better, but it didn't help my gas money. All right, so I put headers on it. Headers are extractor exhaust. Instead of the exhaust having to push its way out into this little cast iron manifold where there's, you know, pressure pulses. Uh, the, exact, the headers go down there to the collector and it sort of sucks the exhaust out of the cylinders when they finally fire. You know, that's what headers are about. So anyway, I said, it gave it a little more power. It didn't change the gas mileage. Still sucking gas. Finally, I called the salvage yard. I said, you got a chunk with some ratio higher than 332? They sold me a 275 out of a Ranchero, which is that car there, for $25. And they took my old differential chunk because I didn't need it, didn't want it anymore, and they could sell that to somebody else. So they just swapped out for me. Basically, they charged me 25 foot up. And you had to count the number of splines. I think it was 28 or 30 splines. And, I, and we counted the splines, and it had the right number of splines for mine. So I bought that chunk, and I put it in my gas mileage doubled from 7 to 14 miles to the gallon. Now, I will say my speedometer was screwy, but I noticed when I was driving 32 miles each way to work every day that I was only burning half as much gas. That's how I knew what my gas mileage changed to. That's how much difference the, the differential can make. All right, so when your torque is applied, when you're accelerating, you see this is going to turn like that because it's trying to turn the tires like this. Have you ever been under a Camaro, one of the old Camaros? And have you ever noticed on a Camaro, bolted to the rear end is a long thing about this long, a steel part is hooked to a, the body up there. 
and that's supposed to keep that from happening. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, see what I'm talking about? That's basically it. That long knife looking piece of metal is bolted real solidly to that uh, rear axle. Uh, you know, if you got if you got leaf springs or if you got fall springs, that thing's going to try to do this every time. And if you get on it a lot and you do a lot of that kind of stuff, over time it loosens up all of the body parts on the car. You wind up in the car that rattles and all that kind of stuff. When Grandma and Grandpa drive, they just put her around on it and their car is nice and tight. All right, so turning requires a drive wheel through all the different speeds, right? So not only do you have to turn sharper on the inner wheel, but you're gonna, this one here is going to be rolling at a different speed from that one. And so what that means is you need these differential gears. And these are the most failure-prone parts on the whole rear end. These are the ones, when we've had to go into a rear end and work on it, it's because these are all busted up. So this right here is where the torque is actually transmitted. The ring gear turns this carrier, and these gears right here create the, you know, the connection between there and there. And you can see the little teeth, how they break off. If somebody gets really ugly with it, it can shear those teeth off there and make a mess out of them. So this axle's coming in from the side, you got a pinion here, you got a shaft to ride the pinion right on. And some of you guys have already pulled the thing apart and Nicholas on his uh, the mods that y'all had. We did that last semester when we pulled the rear end apart on it. Alright, there's your differential side gear. You know that spider gear close up. And you got a little teeth in here and that little polished shaft goes through that one. And that's just half of the gear. Now spiral bevel versus hypoid gears. This is spiral bevel gears. Go straight in to the center. If you drew an X right there like crosshairs, it's going straight in. High point gear say either goes in below or above. It doesn't go straight in. Got it? So spiral bevel goes straight in, high point. Now the old model T had uh, straight in, but it did not ever just spur gears like that. You didn't have anything spiral on there. And this right here was one of the slickest things that Ford came up with all over the world. They were saying, wow, that rear end really works good. Well, then here you got differential gears set up similar to what you have on a regular rear end today. Now, some of them had a worm shaft over here. Uh, let me throw the Model T. And they have a worm gear out there that was vaguely similar to a helical cup gear, and that worm would turn down. So this was turning pretty fast, you know, to drive you down the road. But you didn't have to go all that quick back then. Helical ring gear and pinions on front wheel drive transactions. And we talked to them, the ones of you guys that have been in manual transmission are going to recognize this. And you've got to give me power flow on transaxle and transmission before the end of the day. Okay. You got that already? You got it up here? You got it? You can do it? Right now. I'm going to put you on YouTube. All right. All right. So center, chunk, and CV axle. A lot of it. First time I ever saw this, as far as just the chunk on a rear wheel drive car that had CV axles coming out. Was it? And I'm sure there was somebody doing it before I saw it. But 1984, I went to a school on Maricar XR, Maricar XR 4Ti, and that was when I saw these aluminum differential housings. Now some of them are cast iron, and these CV axles going out. This is like a rear view of that. You know, that's a square plate, which is kind of dumb. But anyway, the simple fact is, uh, another little short story. Uh, 2003 Explorer belonged to the campus director in Greenville's daughter was making a really bad roaring noise. And I'm not talking about gear whining, I'm talking about whoa, 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 you know, bearing issues. And we, I've actually got a recording that we made when we got our chassis gear going from here to place to place to place. And when we tore the rear end down, the bearings in here were just totally brindled out and wore out and destroyed. So we bought a set of bearings and we put, the, put it together, we set it all up and everything. And we still had noise back there, but not quite as much. So when we moved our chassis gear out here, it turned out that these hubs out here, the bearings in and out, they were wore out too. So we, we cut them all apart. You could actually see the bearings, every one of them. So why these bearings and those bearings would have gone bad at the same time, I have no idea. But I did remember this Mazda 626, not, I'm sorry, it wasn't a 626, duh. It was an RX-7 that went to, uh, the dealership kept putting rear ends and rear bearings in it and all, because after about a month, the bearings would start making noise. And uh, they finally gave up when they bought the car back. The guy got a different car, and they took, sent that car to the training center in, uh, in uh, Jacksonville down there. Well, they're there talking about it. <laughs> and the instructor down there found out that the battery ground was not connected to the engine block like it should have been. And every time you started the car, the thing would run down the frame, go into the rear end, arc on the bearings, come back up the park brake cable, and the car would start. 
And so every time he went to start the car, it would arc on the bearings because it was the only connection he could find. And it would wipe the bearings out. And after you rolled on them, while you couldn't tell what happened. Um, that's a true story. All right, so don't do this. If you got aluminum housing, like on an Explorer or something, don't put the jack under there and be jacking up on that unless you've got some kind of piece of wood on there or something. Because you will bust that aluminum. And if you bust that aluminum, that is a pricey little piece of aluminum. No rear end, all that kind of stuff. We got some of these chunks here. The one that you tore down the other day, remember that one on the bench was one like this. Um, so anyway, be careful about that. Limited slip differentials, uh, the ones like in the, a lot of the vehicles, and I'm not all exactly the same, so this is sort of a generic thing right here. Uh, there's a big old, this spring right here, actually has got, you know, is looped out so that can go through it. And you got clutches here that actually are, give these uh, the propensity, see there's polished here and on the inside, and so basically whenever your uh, one wheel's turning, it sort of makes the other wheel turn, but they can slip when you're going around the corner, but you got to have limited slip additive in there. Um, and let's see, I used to have a bottle of that stuff around here. Uh, I don't know where it is now. Limited slip additive. A whole bottle of limited slip additive, and when you smell it, you'll never forget the smell of it as long as you live. And uh, mm -hmm. usually whenever I pass it around and I have everybody smell of it, everybody goes, you know, because they don't want to smell it, you know, it's just awful. But uh, one way or another, if you ever see a limited slipper in that doesn't have, like if somebody fleshed it out and they didn't put the friction modifier back in it, when you're going around a curve, you'll feel those uh, clutches chatter. And go, <laughs> I've actually seen brand spanking new trucks that did that because when Ford built them up there, they would actually put their own grease in there. And sometimes they would do that to see what kind of warranty claim you would file. You know what I'm saying? Or sometimes they would put uh, trucks together to see if it was being pre-delivered properly, see if you're checking fluid levels. Uh, they would leave the oil out of the rear end. And then it, they'd flag that serial number, and if the truck came back with a burned up rear end, they know that you didn't check the fluid levels because <laughs> they left it dry on purpose. Uh, but anyway, one way or another, that's what that spring looks like. And let me tell you something, that spring is an absolute pain to get out of there. Maybe a trick that a lot of other people know. Well, we've, we've done these here before. I'll tell you something else that's strange. These little spider gears, you know, these little gears right here, the spider gears that we're seeing, that gear, that gear, this one, and that one. Uh, we've had a, a 98 F-150 came in here, and we bought a set of spider gears for it because the spider gears were all broke up in it, and they were $65 for a set of spider gears. Ain't too bad, right? We got a Chevrolet in here about that same year model, and we bought them from the dealer now. And we were buying spider gear for that one. They were $550 for spider gears for a Chevrolet, but the same gears practically for a Ford were 65 bucks. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the ones on the Ford were made in China. I don't know, whatever. Uh, uh, so this cone top limited, limited slip differential. Uh, now this right here, they have cones in there. They have sort of slightly different got springs pushing them out there. Uh, you know, I don't even know what these are in, but I know some vehicles have got them. You know, so. Anyway, bearings and preload. More about this later on. We'll get, get to it in a minute. Uh, we're working our way through this. Uh, these are these are tapered bearings. You got to have one here, one here. I'm gonna have you that thing put together where you can see it later in a minute. Tapered roller bearing here. Now these preload right here. You got to have preload here. Got to have preload here. Those bearings are supposed to have pressure on them so that those gears can do nothing except turn. You know, all those gears getting out of a relationship to each other. So you got to have these bearings preloaded. There's your differential carrier, which is what that bolts to. I'm going to tell you something else too. Be really, really careful with this ring gear because a lot of the time these uh, bolts right here will be left hand thread. Okay, you got that? Not always. Sometimes they're riveted and you got to use an air hammer to rivet them. I mean, to cut the rivets off of them and then put about foot bolts back in there. Um, but that's usually on front wheel drive stuff. Uh, now, there's your gear ring gear opinion. Now, you heard me talk about backlash. Some of you guys measure backlash, right? Backlash right here is how much space there is between these gears. All right, and you're going to measure it with a dial indicator set up just like that. Now, for some strange reason, every time I have somebody to pull this off, maybe somebody this semester did that, they want to put this dial indicator every other way except the right way when they're measuring backlash. But if you understand that you're trying to see, you got this the pinion gear locked where it can't move, and this one right here, you're going to see how much space there is. You're measuring this actual space between these gears, ring gear and pinion being here. You know, so just be aware of that. Whenever you do a backlash uh, worksheet, that's how that's supposed to work. Now you got a normal pattern. What you're going to do is you're going to you're going to paint your gears like with with some marking paint. 
Matter of fact, I've got some brand new rear ends over there that you can pull the cover off, and you can see where Ford used some white, looks almost like white grease or something they put on it. And they turned it through, and you can see the pattern. This is a normal pattern under heavy load, and that is a pattern under a light load. That's what it's supposed to look like, right? And there's the heel and there's the toe of the ring gear. Now, this is what the contact pattern between the pinion gear and the ring gear. All right, this one right here, if you got insufficient backlash, if the ring gear is too close to the pinion, and then you'll, we'll get a little shot of seeing that, what we're talking about in a minute. Now, when the ring gear is too close to the pinion, the backlash is insufficient, your pattern is going to look like that. It's going to be down there, you know, right hunting the bottom of those gears. If you got too much backlash, it's going to be way up here. You see how that, that marking grease helps you out with that? Uh, when it's too far away, the pattern will be near the heel of the ring gear, but consistent on both sides of the gear key shown there. Reducing the backlash, which moves the ring gear closer, would remove the pattern closer to the middle of where you want it to be right in here. All right. Now, when the pinion's not deep enough, if you the shim under that bearing, you remember when you press the bearing off, and that shim is too thin, and the pinion, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, well, pinion's not deep enough, to, uh, if the thin not, the shim is not thick enough, the pinion will be too far, you know, recessed away from the uh, ring gear, and you're going to see a pattern that looks like that right there. Uh, high heel contact on the drive side, high toe contact on the coast side. Uh, I will tell you that some of these patterns, if you're not paying attention and really have these memorized or a cheat sheet to go by, you may get confused even when you're looking at the pattern in the, in the thing. When the, uh, if, when the shim's too thick, the pattern's going to have low toe contact on the drive side and low heel contact on the coast side. That's the pinion being too far, uh, you know, in there. All right. Now, this is what it looks like in the real world when you're putting the marking compound on these things. All right. Let me see if I can make this plate. Nope. Hold on. I think I have to click on it. There we go. Now this is not going to be a moving picture, but it's going to go through there. See where they put the marking compound on those gears, and they're looking at them. You know, they're basically seeing the seeing what it where it's making its mark. In the real world, that's what that looks like. You can look at that if you go just pay attention, and you can see how that's looking. See how that pattern looks. So is that good because it's in the middle? Yeah, that's pretty much what you're going to be looking for. All right. All right, there you go. So, adjusting your backlash. Some of them have got threaded bearing adjusters. The Dodges used to do that. And some of them got shims. Uh, the shims are various different thicknesses. And what you're supposed to do, like I was talking about last time, you start out with shims that are kind of snug with a slide in there, your thumbs. And that way you... You're going to add to one side and take away from the other the same amount in order to move it back and forth. When you get through, you're going to add about four to six thousandths to each shim and drive those in there, and that gives you a really good bearing preload. That's one of the reasons you got to use that big tool to spread that case apart to get the, uh, the uh, carrier out because the preload is so tight it's holding it in there. It's really difficult to get it out of them aluminum ones if you don't have that tool to spread them out. All right, but adjusted backlash, you'd screw this one that way and that one that way, keeping your preload the same, you know, moving the same amount of distance. And then you have to actually measure your preload and all that. Now you're adjusting your pinion depth, you're changing this shim right here. See, there's your little crush sleeve. And anytime you go too far, you go too deep and you get too much uh, preload on it, you gotta take that crush sleeve out of there and replace it, which basically you take the yoke, you take that bearing, you fish that sleeve out of there, you put another one in there, put the bearing back in there and you go back again. Uh, you can actually get the right preload without a crush sleeve in there, but you can't run the rear end that way because it runs in the trouble. Okay, so anyway, there's your drive pinion, there's your ring gear. And see, some crush sleeves look like this, and some of them look like that. you got to use the right kind. And so just be aware of that. Okay, so preload is really important. You get a little, some of you guys may have even seen this little uh, inch pound torque wrench I got that looks like that one right there, except it's not blue, it's black. And you're, what you're doing is you're, you're going to use Loctite on your pinion nut when you put it back on so it don't come back off because it will come loose. You don't have some Loctite on there. Preload is constant pressure applied to the bearing to prevent the gear from becoming misaligned, okay? Uh, and, they'll, and, and you can misalign and mismatch gears will sing and whine. The first time I ever put uh, a pinion and ring gears in a, in a rear end was on a 77 uh, Chrysler. And I just figured, nuts and bolts, throw that thing together, you know, pop them gears in there and go to town. I didn't set it up or nothing. 
I mean, I did kind of preload the bearing, but I didn't have it set up right. And when I drove it down the road, it was just singing to beat the band. Ying, 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 ying. I said, what in the world is this? And then I called this guy that I worked with, you know, in Enterprise before I went down to Texas. And he said, you paint it like you're painting your porch, and, you know, you turn it through, look at your pattern, all that stuff. But, uh, Anyway, uh, preload is expected to be a little bit higher on new bearings. So about usually be about half as much on new bearings as it is on the old ones. Uh, I mean, excuse me, half as much on the old ones as the new ones. Okay, measure pinion bearing preload before you install the carrier ringer. I like to know what this little sucker's got going before I put that carrier in there. I want to make sure these are preloaded because you can have the the uh, carrier preloaded really well and have not enough preload on these, and that's not a good thing either. Tighten it up with a breaker bar and then use an inch pound torque. Don't use an impact wrench on this because you've got to stop that thing. You're going to tighten it a little bit, check your preload. Tighten it a little more, turn it through, check your preload. Keep going and you're basically looking for about 10 to 14 inch pounds on new bearings and about half that much on old ones. And that includes the carrier preload to be about 20 inches tops, you know. And this is how much it takes to keep that thing turning. Now you cannot do this with the tires and the brakes on it and all that because it's going to mess your reading up. So if you're checking this, you're going to need to pull the tire, pull the brake drums, make sure that there ain't nothing keeping them axles from turning out there. It's really important to remember that. This is the amount of torque required to keep it turning, not how much it torques, you know, to start it turning. All right, here's you setting your backlash. There's one where you're turning them in the old uh, adjuster. And this one right here, see those shims? That one that you torque part got these shims on it. All right, and they're checking backlash with that right there. There's your pumpkin top. See how you set that one up right there in the vise? You get it. You get it just like it's supposed to be, and then you put it on the in the uh, housing, and you're good to go. Now, pay a close attention to this, and remember what you're looking at here. The one that you're taking dry line, you're going to see a picture very similar to this on your final, and you're going to have to identify these. All right. So there's your pinion here, your inner bearing. The shim is right here. You remember that. Uh, and try not to ruin the bearing when you're pressing it off there. Because, uh, all right, pinion shaft is here. There's your crush sleeve. See, it actually almost looks like part of that. You see how the crush sleeve is pinched between that inner bearing race and that, stop, that boss right there? There's your outer bearing. There's your seal. No dust shield there. And your pinion flange. Uh, you might even look at that video that I got on YouTube. It's got like five or six, five hundred something thousand big views. But I mean, we had to actually use a balancer puller to pull the, that uh, flange off. Sometimes it's really annoying, but it's not too bad. Um, all right, when you replace the pinion seal, you can look at video up I'm talking about. Mark the nut, the flange, and the socket with white outer paint. Put a line. All right, count the turns, remove the nuts. Usually going to be about 16 turns. Remove the flange. Pull it off with a puller or whatever you got to do. Replace the seal. Reinstall the flange and the nut. Count the turns and stop with the same number of turns. Stop on the same mark. You'll be okay. Some yo-yo watched that video and, you know, was calling me ugly names and said, hey, you idiot, don't you have a torque wrench? Well, you don't use a torque wrench on that, okay? Mm -hmm. And then somebody else came along and said, hey, man, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. All right. They, uh, and then check the axle vent to make sure it's not clogged. I showed you the transmission vent on that little, it's a little thing up there. It's supposed to let the air come and go as the oil gets hot. And he's, you know, the thing needs to breathe. Uh, check the axle vent to make sure it's not clogged and refill it with the right oil. You see that pinion seal leaking. They don't usually ever do this unless there's a pressure buildup in there that forces all that. As a matter of fact, some guys will fix the axle vent. See, if the axle vent stopped up, they'll unstop it first and see if it quits leaking before they ever replace it. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with that. If it stops leaking, you're good to go. That's the end of that. You get something new out of that. You get something out of it you didn't get the first time we talked about differential, right? You soak up a lot of stuff. Uh, the note taker, he's been making some notes over here. Oh, I yeah. 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 Yeah.